Hey YouTubers, it's Jordan with another service on a piece of vintage audio. Today's victim is a Yamaha CR2020. And this has a bit of a problem that's a little bit odd. But I'll tell you the story. This was sent to another shop uh, somewhere up in the Los Angeles area. I'm not going to name names. And they put LEDs in the thing. Uh, because everything on the discussion board say, you gotta convert up to LEDs. LEDs are better. They last forever. Convert it to LEDs. LEDs. But I'm sorry, I don't buy into that. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why. And the Yamahas uh, really hit home with this. Now, first of all, Yamahas base their lamps, or base their illumination on incandescent lamps which have a specific loading to them. Uh, between about 80 and 100 milliampers. Now, you're saying, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means that the system assumes that all of the lamps are going to draw the same current. Now, when you install LEDs, the way the circuitry is laid out, these are nice and bright, but the middle ones here, although they're lit up, are very dim. Also, the dial pointer is barely lit at all, so that doesn't really work. The other issue is, is that Yamahas use the power supply that feeds the lamps uh, on some models. I don't remember if it's this one, but on some. And it uses it as part of the fast turnoff circuit for the protection. So, you'll notice on some machines, particularly I've noticed it on the uh, cr 620 and 820, the lamps are out, it will take a long time for the protection relay to disengage. And of course, the amp is destabilizing. By the time it does disengage, there's a big scary pop, which over time murders the relay. So uh, I don't think that's an issue on the 2020, because the relay pretty much unmutes instantly. Uh, but he wants it converted back to original incandescent lamps. On top of that, the uh, protection relay in this thing is shot. You can wiggle it and jiggle it and the channels will cut out. And it just kind of needs general maintenance. So that's what we're going to do today is just the basic thing and replacing the lamps. Now before you ever take a Yamaha CR20 or 40 series out of the case, or actually I think this is just valid for the 20 series. Back me up here if you know a little bit more than these than I do. Behind here, there is a bracket, a guide bracket, that helps guide the machine into the wood case. And it just so happens that that bracket runs directly in behind where the tuning string goes. So if your tuner isn't set to anywhere but over here, at the very right, there's a good probability that you will break off the tuning string when you either install or remove the cabinet. So again, on the Yamahas, make sure that the dial is to the right before you take it out of the case. So let's get this guy out of the case and then we'll proceed from there. Let me show you what I mean. So getting this out of the case, as soon as we slide it out, you see the fancy little bracket there. And if you move the tuner, you can see that the dial pointer and the string focus damn it there we go uh, coincide with that bracket really and if you try to push it back in there's a very good chance that the tuner string and all that will get caught up on that bracket back there and what that will mean is the death of your tuner string. So when you take these out of the case, just crank them all the way to the right. And that will usually solve the issue. So I'm going to put the camera down again, and then it will pull it all the way out of the case. So here's the inside of a 2020. 1020 basically looks the same, just a different size transformer. The main majority of failures that occur on these series of machines is in the regulated power supply, uh, primarily with the regulators that regulate the plus and minus, uh, I believe it's 35 volts. I've got another video on the 1020 regulated repair. And so there's the uh, LEDs that somebody put in the old lamp holders with tape here, not really 
too fond of that. The tape's already coming loose, so eventually they would have fallen out. And if we just follow that back down to the main board, trying to look and see if he's got dropping resistors for these, or if these are high voltage LEDs that run on between 6 and 12 volts. I'm going to assume the latter. The other thing that goes wrong related to the regulated power supply board, let's get some light on this, shine down in here. There's a four pin connector or a five pin connector right there. Focus you bastard. There we go. So that connector down there solders on the other side of the board here. And it's really hard to see this. But you can see that the quality of the solder is kind of cruddy and those at least two of those five pins will break loose usually the outer ones which is true of this one too so we need to resolder those surprisingly unless the machine uh, has been in an environment where there is very little ventilation the caps don't die all that often we're going to check the ones next to the heat sinks and stuff because obviously the uh, wrapper is starting to shrink back suggesting excessive heat. This protection relay is probably going to need to get burnished or replaced. It's a 12 volt style not a 24 volt style. And then when you start looking at the 2020 and the 3020 uh, the driver transistors on the driver boards and sometimes the outputs but rarely the outputs will break loose, the collectors will break loose, and they will cause all sorts of scary transients to appear in the audio. So that's another thing that we'll look at too. So the first thing that I'm going to do is get this up on the lamp so it'll be suspended over the machine. And then we'll start taking the uh, regulated power supply board loose so that we can resolder those connections and check some capacitors. Okay, so as far as getting this board up, the easiest way to do that, there are two screws on the top, one here and one here. We're just going to take those loose. And then to avoid stress on cabling, uh, these ones have already been cut, but they're usually zip ties here. I usually cut those. Uh, this is pretty loose already, so uh, the next thing I'm going to do to make it easier, there are screws down here and here that hold brackets for the giant power supply capacitors which also support that back board. So we're going to take those loose too. And one of them is down here. Just take it loose, don't take it out because the brackets will slide forward. Uh, there's another one down here. Again, just take it loose and there should be ones on the opposite sides. And when you get the board up and out, that will allow you to slide the vertical board forward so that you can resolder it. So now that you've got that loose holding here and pushing backwards, grab the board and just wiggle it loose. Usually it comes right out. Clear this capacitor, which is why you're pulling back here. And now something got a little bit hot here. There are fusible resistors here, here. And underneath here which you need to check too given the amount of heat here that's considerable so let's see if we can get the setup on its side so we can look at the underside of the board and hopefully the camera will behave here it doesn't look like it's going to but we can try so anyway this is the underside of a 2020 and there's evidence here that somebody has resoldered this board. Lots of flux here, cheap solder, but regardless, they did it, and it looks like it hasn't crystallized, so it was probably a high, high temperature gun. If there's this much flux involved, I'll usually recommend that you scrape all this away. Uh, I'm just a little bit anal, but in some cases, it will attract solder bridges, which can wreak havoc. So let's just get a dry toothbrush and clean that up just a little bit. So while you've got this apart, I'll get an ESR meter. 
a basic good one to use is the uh, famous capacitor wizard uh, done by Independence Electronics. They're a pretty good thing. Uh, there's much better ones out there, but then again, you could spend a lot more money too. So that's just something of note. So I'm going to test all the power supply capacitors. A chime indicates good ESR. And those ones that look like they were shrunk does not register, nor does that one. Okay, so those are both dead. My suspicions were correct. So let's look at a couple of other ones. That one's okay. There's another one over here. And that one's tired, so I should mark that one for replacement. And that one's okay. And these other ones I'll check later from the top side. It's going to take too long to do it all. So I'll be nice to you guys and just kind of do those. And any more that I find effective, we'll uh, replace them. So the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to rotate this at an angle so that you can hopefully see the back side of that circuit board I was talking to you about. Let's slide this forward a little bit. If you want, you can take the front bracket off that holds the capacitors and you can slide this forward even more. I'm hanging up on some it looks like. Take this screw a little bit more loose. There we go. Likewise on the other side. I know I'm starting to do more stuff in real time. I'm hoping this isn't boring you guys. So now that the board's up, let's get in a little bit closer here. Somebody's attempted to resolder that, but they didn't do a very good job. Let's see if the camera will allow me to zoom in. Yeah. So what you're looking at here is tired solder. And if you look around the base of the connections, you can see, if it will focus, there we go, you can see these little cracks forming, which are pretty much a guarantee that it's going to die. And when it dies, you lose half of your power supply, and things get noisy and whatever real quick. So I'm just going to resolder these real quick. And then I'll pause the camera while I replace all these dead caps. And then we'll get to more general maintenance. Oops, solder bridge. What to do when you get a solder bridge? You got an old-fashioned solder sucker that's helpful. I'll clean up the rest of that garbage in a little bit. And we'll just reapply this. That center one's fine. Somebody looks like they resoldered that one. The outsides one always die first, which makes me wonder whether it's a previous service that weakens it or it just weakens because of the current going through it creating heat crystallizing the solder and if you want you can check that little orange capacitor that stands up at the back while you're at it which is perfectly fine so ah I'm going to get the phone and then replace the caps in this thing and we'll continue from there okay so we've got the board back in and I've replaced four capacitors uh, they were the two that were obviously checked bad earlier that we replaced. There was a third one here that was kind of tired that we got rid of. And then there was another one adjacent to it that I didn't like at all. Uh, didn't test consistently. One thing uh, I should make you aware of. There are a series of capacitors made by Panasonic. Which are kind of these purpley blue looking ones. They were in production from about 1970 to about 1978, and you'll occasionally see them in machines. They almost always go bad. I uh, haven't seen 
an instance where they tested good. Uh, they'll usually be marginal or open. So that's another thing to look at. A great way to troubleshoot death of capacitors is does it have a high frequency going through it, high voltage, or is it next to heat? I'm just going to let the machine get that one. Uh, so anyway, the next thing that we'll focus on is chemically treating all the switches and controls with keg deoxid. Uh, keg deoxid is a wonderful thing. You want it. It's good. Uh, the Yamaha is a little tricky, so I'll do a brief tutorial on how to get that apart. But basically, uh, the top controls are easy. If we just zoom in here, you see the little holes. Inject the cleaner into the holes of the push button switches and work them a bazillion times. Uh, the speaker selector switch, you can kind of sort of see from down here. It's got that big bundle of wires coming out of it. You can get cleaner down there. The uh, tone and toggle switches are open back. Likewise, for the uh, selector switches down here, again, open back. You can see the little square openings there. That's where you get that into. Now, the tone controls are a little bit of a pain uh, because of where they're located. And in order to get to those, there's a reason why they have screws here. You have a screw here, screw here, screw here, and screw here. You undo these, and these come up and out. Uh, the switches do. And that will give you exposure to the s controls underneath, which are the uh, tone controls, essentially, and a few other things. Now, if you're really cautious and you don't want to fidget with the wiring harness, which I recommend because these are old and brittle and fragile, you can take the amplifier boards loose here and here, uh, and you can pull these up and away enough to get these out these top rows of switches here, in which case you can gain access to the rest of the pots that you'll need to clean. But don't just spray cleaner in the back in the darkened areas that you can't see. Uh, not the greatest idea. So because that's such a long and tedious process, I'm going to save that to the end and just do that off camera. And the next thing we're going to focus on is the amplifier boards uh, because it's very common for them to have uh, the screws that hold the driver transistors to the circuit board break loose, which also carry collector current, which when they do break loose will create all sorts of loud popping and cracking and throwing the machine into protect. So let's get one of those boards up so I can show you what you're looking at. With the board up, here's what you're looking at on a 2020. And uh, these are not so much important as the Class A driver here, that needs to be tightened down. Yeah, you know, just a busy day here. And then flip the machine over and make sure that the output transistors are secured. That's kind of self-explanatory, so I'll leave you guys to that. I'm going to check all these and then we'll uh, focus on lamp replacements. Because i got a lot of stuff to tell you about lamp replacements. Okay, so back to this. We're replacing these because they're LEDs. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, LEDs are not the best choice for these machines. Uh, these are obviously high voltage LEDs. Let's see if I can get a hold of it here. I really hate the cameras don't focus worth this shit. Let's focus on the close object. There we go. And now we've got, now we've got it, 15 volts AC and DC, which is fine because these run on 14 volt 80 milliampers. So the guy at least had a brain in his head to use the right voltage LEDs, but they don't all load the same. So what we're going to do is replace them with incandescents. That's what the customer wanted. It's back to stock. Now, the lamps that you use... I'm going to grab here are 14 volt 80 milliampere and they're about four four and a half millimeters 4.12 anyways these are the kind of things that you use for this application I just use heat shrink and solder them directly to the leads and then push them in there uh, there used to be a little green lamp sock there, but apparently it ain't there no more. 
Oh well. So uh, those were originally supposed to be green. You can cheat by coloring them with a green sharpie. But like I said before, uh, you replace them all and they all have to be matched. So they all have to be 80 milliampers. As far as doing the dial pointer, it's actually a lot easier than you think. It's just a little bit of wire routing. Take loose the two screws here. Put them somewhere you don't lose them since I'm so good at losing screws. Magnetized tools are helpful here, by the way. And we'll just work that loose. And you put the point source illumination in there too, so that's why it didn't illuminate. It wasn't shining forward, it was shining to the wall of the dial pointer lamp container. You also didn't cover those leads, so they could have easily shorted out against the middle plate there, which writing on a grounded surface would have grounded out the uh, lamp supply, not the best and brightest. Always use heat shrinking with these things. So, we're going to replace the lamps uh, using the correct incandescence and heat shrinking and then color them green to try to restore the uh, best possible. Yes, you can use a green sharpie, it does kind of sort of work. And then we'll turn it on and see what it looks like. In case you're wondering how I do the lamps, I cut the bare leaves real short, tin both sides, and then I'll just very briefly touch them together. Come on, let's zoom in here a little bit so people can see what's up. Oh, come on. You were just focused there. So that's how it works. And then I will slip the, uh, the heat shrinking over top of them. God, I hate this freaking camera. There we go. So I'll just slip the, uh, make sure they're straightened out. And slip the heat shrink tubing over them. Might have to fight with it a little bit. Anyway, I can't really do this with two hands. So anyway, there's one lead over the top of the lamp there. The other one's hung up. Try and get both of them to go up there, cooperate. There we go. So that's your finished product. And then when you heat shrink it, that all shrinks down and it fits all nice and cozy inside of there. Do the same process for the rest of the lamps along the meter block here, and you can't go wrong. So with the lamps replaced, here's what I'm talking about. Even illumination. They all have the same brightness to them, all four of them, all the meter lamps here. And the dial pointer. It's hard to see in this light, but it's lit up fine. So we're going to color all these lamps and then stick them back in there. Okay, here it is, the final test. We got everything back together. Let's flip the switch and see the pretty green lights. Awesome. Those two must have come out of their socket. So I'll have to get that back in there. Otherwise, it looks pretty good. So let's... Uh, make some corrections and then we'll try again okay Yamaha lamps take two there we go nice and even now cool so that'll be good he'll like that let's button this thing back up all right, so here it is all back together. So we treated all the switches and controls, the deoxid, replaced those couple of bad capacitors uh, in the power supply, redid the soldering on the uh, five pin socket that's on the back of the power supply board, replaced the lamps, and it's hard to tell in this light, really the, the Yamaha lamps really only work best at night. Um, if you want it to be a little bit brighter, you can use a, a 12 volt, uh, style lamp, but they won't last as long. Uh, it was really meant to be an accent so that you could see it in dim light or in the dark. It's kind of a, a cool green color. 
So, about lamps, going back to the lamp thing again. The guy who I get lamps from is Dave, Dave Warzanowski. Uh, really great guy, goes online by Dwojo, uh, if you've been around the Audio Karma forums and the like. He is the reigning expert on vintage lamps for uh, receivers, amplifiers, etc. And the difference is, lamps and LEDs uh, differ in the way that they work. The wavelength that an LED puts out uh, is different than an incandescent lamp. And I'm not just talking about color temperature, I'm talking about the way the light propagates to the atmosphere. The LEDs are what I like to call a point source, meaning even if they're diffused, uh, they still tend to concentrate light around where they emit it, versus an incandescent lamp, which has a very wide angle of dispersion, a different wavelength. So uh, this can definitely be evident if you're using those incandescent replacement lamps. Like for example, in the shop lamp here, we have a fluorescent and we have an incandescent, or excuse me, a fluorescent and an LED. And the LED lamp, yes, it's nice and bright, but I've tried three or four different color temperatures from warm to cool, and no matter what, uh, I just noticed that the light does not propagate into very dark areas very well but they, an incandescent will. So uh, the second thing is that uh, not only is it a point source, but in the case of the Yamahas, again, has to deal with loading uh, because the lamp circuit's expecting a specific load and also the protection circuit, which now the turnoff cycle has been improved by about a second and a half, uh, is loaded down. It loads the protection circuit down, so it helps at the fast turnoff. It's just some clever engineer's way of cutting costs. So Dave Warzanowski is his name, goes by Dwojo. He has a website, Google it. Uh, just give him the make and model of your set. Likely he'll have a kit for it. If not, he'll research and find what you need. No, it's not as cheap as the piece of crap lamps that you buy on MCM and Parts Express, but uh, they're very long life. Most of what he sells is seven to 10,000 hour lamps, so you're not going to have to change them every year. Uh, and they produce a much more uh, natural light what the manufacturer intended. For example, Marantz's are supposed to have that aqua blue to them, and a lot of times these LED kits will turn them a gothic blue, and they don't look very pretty. Um, if you visit repairaudio.com and click on the FAQ section of the website, you'll see the difference between the incandescent lamp and the LED lamp in Marantz 2270, and there is a difference. So, uh, also, is heat uh, a lot of people just buy whatever's available, and the heat will often distort or destroy the lamp housing. Very true in Marantz machines, especially if they're the later B generation that has the plastic lamp housings. So lamps are very crucial in these machines, not only for looks, but for longevity of parts. And obviously, if you're putting a 300 milliampere lamp in what requires a 100 milliampere lamp, you're going to load down the transformer and eventually overheat the winding that supplies the lamps. So that's not good either. So, uh, anyway, this is the wrap-up of a Yamaha CR2020 service. You can service a 1020 in the same way. 3020 is a little bit different, uh, but I unfortunately don't have a 3020 to show you as far as servicing. So, uh, perhaps if one comes in, I'll make a video on that, too. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get into more depth about taking the front panel switches out to get to the bottom controls. Uh, again... Pull up the heat sinks, create some room, undo the top level of screws and pull them up and away to deox it. Uh, it is possible. It's a little bit of a fight, but it's possible. And uh, again, thank you for watching the videos. Uh, there will be more stuff to come soon. As you can tell by where I work, there are a lot of machines in. Uh, unfortunately, Lots of garbage, too, but uh, I like to focus on the classic and vintage stuff because I believe it has a future uh, rather than just hitting the e-waste site. So uh, keep your eyes open. More stuff to come soon. And for you vintage TV people, yeah, I'm sorry I haven't gotten into a vintage TV video in a long time. I've just been absolutely swamped with work and life and whatever else, so I just try to squeeze these in wherever I can. Thanks for watching. More to come soon.